Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk, can you hear me okay? I'm going to talk about uh, explainability today, but to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about my journey so, so you get an idea of my perspective. I've been applying science, but also I have been an entrepreneur, so I kind of have to juggle the two worlds together. So um, when I was 20 years old, I'm from Costa Rica, and I wanted to build an AI company, and I didn't know about AI or business, so I decided to go to Japan, and over there I learned about similarity, clustering, how to scale up similarity. So that kind of had a big influence of what I did later, which was to apply similarity into uh, genomic problems for stem cell uh, uh, research. And at some point in 2012, I decided to quit my career in science and eventually made my way to Chicago and, and started a company. So we have been working, um, you know, in explainability and finding different uh, patterns by, by using uh, distance functions. That's what I want to share with you today. So my point of view combines a uh, desire of making accessible AI. I feel that AI right now is like the first cars that were wooden and they were very hard to ride. And eventually we had uh, more comfortable um, cars that are softer. So my focus is on making AI more comfortable to the non-technical user. So in a way, my users are, are not data scientists, are not technical people, but people who don't know much about math and about uh, algorithms. So, uh, my company, C Machines, works on, on um, explainability in the marketing product phases. And the technology has been deployed in, in multiple continents and many use cases. And the cool thing about being an entrepreneur is that you get to throw your technology at many places. So these places have been using my technology for years. And, and, but I, I'm not coming here to talk about specific business cases, it's more about um, similarity as a tool so that uh, uh, non-technical users will be able to understand better uh, our technology. So we need to bring or create a bridge between the machine and the human uh, for them to be able to, to use and understand what's going on in the machine. Is we're not enough, there are not enough data scientists and we need to, to scale our solutions to many people that do not have to learn. They should not have to learn math. They should not have to get a, a, a science degree for them to be able to interact with the machine. So that's that's uh, the the angle that I'm that I'm tackling. And why is explainability important? There are many many reasons why we should um, apply uh, or or work on explainability. First is that I don't know any software developer that would build software without a debugger. You always use a debugger to understand what's wrong with your, with your uh, software. And some people say, I just care about accuracy, I don't care about explainability, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not interested. But if you really care about accuracy, you should be able to um, debug your system, understand predictions that are failing, and understand the factors that are driving those predictions to failure or to success. So explainability is very important, even if you just care about accuracy, because it will let you build better models. Uh, sometimes it's not enough to let a neural network figure out certain features. There are fundamental elements that could improve your model, and if you don't find the why behind a prediction, you won't be able to, to, to see these details. The other important factor is ethics, and, and I was interviewed by Forrester, and they they are releasing an ethics paper very soon about you know how how can these algorithms be be account be taken accountable? How can they be transparent so that you know we are not introducing any bias, any kind of um, uh, negative element that discriminates certain groups? So the algorithm itself, I consider it pure. It doesn't really have any any kind of bias, but the data does come with bias, and uh, and you know, if the data is uh, has bias, if the algorithm and the model will output bias, so bias in, bias out. Uh, so so this this report tackles different things, and, and one one you know um, 
thing that relates to data scientists is the algorithmic bias, so the training data has a problem. Then there is the human bias, so historical inequality that is being captured in the data, and you need to get rid of that. And then there are some useful biases, such as in, in the marketing space, where certain users will have attitudes that you want to, um, you know, um, optimize. That. But 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 this is important. We need to make sure that if an algorithm is predicting something, we understand why, so that we are sure that we are not introducing any kind of problem. In fact, we did a project for an insurance company, and we found that even though we were not supposed to use zip codes, the zip codes were in the data, the algorithm was using zip codes, and then the Y factors uh, told us that um, the, the zip, zip code was very, uh, a very strong correlate factor, so we were able to debug the issue and, uh, and fix it to prevent the, the introduction of bias. Um, this is not feature importance. Right? Feature importance uh, is very useful. I'm talking about a much more granular kind of factor, right? That goes at the prediction level. And another important reason why we should work on explainability is because we have we are deploying algorithms that are performing billions of predictions, uh, and they have a specific business purpose: churn prediction, uh, find potential buyers, fraud detection, and whatnot. But the managers, the decision makers of the organization, don't really have a window to all the knowledge that the algorithms are gaining. And that window could change how their business works in a fundamental way that goes beyond the original intended prediction that we wanted to, to, to execute. So for example, we were working for a telecom company performing churn predictions for them. And the operations were great and they were very helpful, but um, we were able to identify based on certain factors and certain predictions that the app that they were using to, to, to engage the customer had a fundamental problem. And so we fixed the app and that improved you know, retention considerably. And that was beyond the original intended uh, purpose of the algorithm. So explainability can change how people do business and how people think about their company. So that's why it is important to let the algorithms speak and tell us what they're finding. So we use examples all the time. We use the word, for instance, for example, many times because human beings are used to explain themselves with examples and, and we can you know, uh, use previous experience to, to help us reason on, on new things. So my approach, and this is not the only way of doing explainability, and, and this is not a talk about explainability, uh, but I'm going to focus on one way of achieving explainability that is through similarity. So using that useful fact that we express ourselves with examples, we want to apply similarity in machine learning. And we'll see some of the shortcomings of doing that and what can you do to improve uh, those shortcomings and, and if it is possible or not. Um, one important thing is that um, um, segmentation has been already um, present in areas such as marketing. The problem is that it is what the experts are calling static. Of course, they're, again, it's calling it a static. It is using um, a, a very useful tool, the very old tool, which is the Euclidean distance. It is a 2,000 year old piece of technology that is still being used for clustering. And the clustering algorithms have evolved, and there are many of them, but the distance function stays the same uh, most of the time. So that's kind of what. what when we say that we are performing dynamic segmentation is when we have better distance functions. And using segmentation, you can perform explanation. So in the case of, of insight-driven uh, organization, they, they will generate $1.2 trillion in 2020. And in the case of marketing, 42% of them are, are thinking about changing that way of doing segmentation. And, and not doing it is considered as a risk. So, so we see that at the industry level, there is a shift 
it's about changing how segmentation and, and clustering is done. Um, and as I said, you know, the venerable Euclidean distance is, is consistently used and you check the open source tools and they all work around the Euclidean distance, but we have very effective uh, accurate algorithms performing predictions, but it seems that the advantages of those algorithms are not uh, coming to the discovery side of the cluster itself. So if, if there is one message uh, I want you to take from this conversation or this talk is uh, that the distance function needs to be replaced. The, the distance function that we are using is all. So the problems with the L2 distance, uh, L1 to LP in general. Uh, curse of dimensionality as you add more dimensions, that, that will be increasing exponentially. Uh, weights are static, so every every dimension weights the same. Um, and then if you wanted to use nearest neighbor uh, as a classifier with an L2 distance, then you won't get the accuracy that you could be getting from any other method. And, and the problem is that then you get these really good um, models, you get uh, you implemented a gradient boosting tree or ensemble, and you got these highly accurate results, and then you need to understand what it's doing, and you try to apply clustering, but the mechanism of the clustering doesn't have anything to do with your, with your highly accurate model. So there is a disconnect between the clustering and the prediction. And, and I consider that as a big problem, but there is a solution. Um, and, and the solution is to look at the distance function. So again, uh, and if, I, I should repeat this because sometimes, you know, when I share this with people, um, the, the problem that is not immediately obvious, but, but the mechanism for the clustering and the mechanism for the prediction is different, right? But what if you had a, a machine learning algorithm that uses similarity that is near a neighbor, and you are able to actually get predictions that are as accurate as a state-of-the-art machine learning classifier? Then it is very interesting because you can take the, the mechanism of that similarity and apply it to clustering. And then your cluster will look completely different. And, and, and that's one of the things, when, when I talk to other data scientists, they say, well, if you can create uh, a nearest neighbor classifier with a distance function that is very accurate, and, um, you know, I would like to see those clusters, because those clusters will let you see the data through the eyes of the classifier directly. And the solution is to create algorithms that create distance functions. So the metric will, will have these properties and probably the, the most interesting one is the triangle inequality. Um, but if you can build distance functions, and there are many ways of building these uh, metrics, um, and your distance is accurate, then you can achieve this. And then you will be able to see the data through the same eyes of the classifier. And the nearest neighbor classifier is very simple. Any, any non-technical person will be able to understand how it works. So it has all these advantages that are about being user-friendly and accessible. So I will give you an example. Imagine we have these uh, features, and we are trying to build the next copy for Starbucks. So it's kind of a weird example, but, but it helps me to uh, explain what I'm, what I'm doing. So you have different features, the kind of packaging, if it is a fancy or a simple or a medium package, if the copy was organic or not. And what we have here is a list of purchases. We don't know what it was the copy that the customer purchased, but we know what are the features about this copy. And you know, if it was live, medium, dark, roast, and other types of features. And if you wanted to cluster this with Names every every feature will weight the same, but in reality there might be sub spaces, part of the space where certain features are more important than others. And that's this is a key concept: being able to select and weight 
dynamically different pictures. That's not something you can do with a, with a typical distance function. You need to build distance functions that achieve this. Uh, so for example, there could be a, a subset of the users that were packaging, simple packaging, and uh, the fact that the that the copy is organic or not is relevant. And, uh, and that means there will be focus on a specific features. And if you build distance functions that achieve this, then you will get different clusters. If you apply k-means here, you will just get every feature weighted in the same way. This is a very quick example of how a, um, a metric distance can work. This is a k-means with uh, Euclidean distance on two rings of points. Every one of these little uh, elements here is a cluster, and the contour is basically the distance at a given point in the space. And here I have created an unsupervised distance um, that learns with k-means and optimizes the k-means uh, objective. And what you see here is that the red value of the distance in, from here to here is a short, is a short distance than here, it's shorter than, than this other red distance value. Right? So you can you can drive more or you can move more in certain pieces of the space. So you're bending the space effectively by changing uh, the distance function that you use in certain parts of the space. So um, neural neighbors are simple to understand. They're ergonomic to the mind. Um, there are certain challenges. Uh, it is expensive to compute, so actually my PhD work and most of my, my time at the company has been focused on creating data structures that make near neighbor effective and fast. And then um, the other problem, so speed is one problem, and then uh, metric learning solves the other problem, which is the persistent usage of the Euclidean distance. Um, so we have shown and we have proven that it is possible to to get highly accurate predictions in, in this way with, with different families of metric distances. Um, and, and going back to the same to the same point I mentioned before, if you have a distance function that gets you great predictions, then those clusters will be really really interesting. And I will show you some examples. Um, so uh, in terms of the speed, I, I was able to create a, a similarity engine, and that's how I started the company when I decided that I had a fast enough index. I think it is not yet a solved problem. There are many data structures, and the field is still active. There are not many people working on it, uh, but it's very interesting. And this is my index. Um, it's uh, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million rows, and the time it takes for it to uh, search for uh, 10 nearest neighbors, I think. Um, and it's, it's a DNA sequence of 20 um, dimensions in this case. And this is one CPU, one 2012 laptop, so my current index is much better. This was a competing approach that after a while it didn't scale so well. So it is possible to get fast nearest neighbor. If you have tried the CycleMarks nearest neighbor classifier after 10,000 items, it's painfully slow, but there are structures that allow you to go faster than that. And then accuracy-wise, um, we have been able to match route perform uh, gradient boosting methods. We have been benchmarked against uh, special hardware, specialized hardware for deep learning, and we are able to match that with metric distances. So it means that it is possible to get highly accurate uh, distance functions, and you get all the nice benefits in terms of user friendliness, and you don't lose any accuracy. So there's no need to use accuracy if you decide to use near and neighbor. And then you get the nice clusters on top of that. This is an example of how a cluster may look like and the factors behind the cluster. Uh, so in this case, um, I have uh, heavy YouTube users and heavy Facebook users, and every one of these little high Slices are clusters, and every one of these little cells is factors that make the cluster that these factors have been selected by the distance function. Uh, so in this case, a Facebook, this is a YouTube user actually, they belong to the uh, rural currency, rural areas, 
uh, blue coral color, and farm fluorite insurance is high. It's correlated to their uh, group. And this is just one cluster. And then the Facebook is a bit different. It's um, very urban people, heavy LinkedIn users. Um, they like to see also. So, so this is just what the distance function discovered to maximize the classification objective. And then you are uh, performing a cluster out of that distance function. You could do the same with, um, with an, in an unsupervised fashion. So you can use label or unlabeled data. So, you know, if you cluster and you have a nearest neighbor, you can see through the eyes of the classifier. Um, you can get nearest neighbor that is accurate, it is possible. And explainability in this fashion is, is industrial. You can, you can debug what's going on with a probe, with a model. Even in, in real time, you can understand if there is some signal that has changed. It's very common that you have a deployment and the input data gets noisy and it is not immediately obvious why the model is failing. So knowing the Y factors for each prediction is, uh, is, will help you to debug models uh, as they are deployed and as they are running billions of predictions per month. Um, and explainability is not feature importance, it's much more. Well, uh, I would like to uh, thank you. And uh, I guess we'll go to uh, questions. Well, uh, okay, that's just a point out there. So, it's new work ever. It's a great point. It's a comparable study, for example, like flowers and things. But now we're doing all kinds of abstractions. So that's not the sort of matter. But, yeah. Uh, has this new work ever looked at this? Okay, yeah, so, so the question to repeat is, yeah, when, whenever you have a space, there are moments where the, where the distance will break, right? Where it will be, if to, maybe they're you know, you're having enough training data or something like that, so you have a, a, a hole there. Um, you know, you can apply regularization to the metric learning generation. So it is possible to, to compensate and, and avoid overfitting, because you could overfit with a metric distance too, right? So, um, you know, it, it is driven in the same way you would drive any other classifier generation. And there are many ways of interpreting a metric distance. Think of it as, think about this type of Euclidean distance. It is weighted, but it can change the weights for any pair of weights it That's one, one possible metric distance. And this is not the one that gets us the results it gets, but, you know, uh, but that, that weighting can be regularized too. Yes? You mentioned that uh, uh, you develop structures that make it scalable compared to other uh, clustering. Could you go over um, what you mean for more detail? What you mean for About the structures? Yeah, yeah so um, I spent um, a lot of time implementing data structures uh, from the literature. There is a really good book from Hannah and Sanet in, in uh, multi-dimensional data structures. And then there is the Similarity Search Blue Book. There, those are the two books that are available. There are a bunch of data structures. Um, a lot of stuff, or what I did uh, in the past, that I published is on the sketches. So take a complex object and convert it into a binary, uh, you know, 64 bits, 128 bits, and then you apply Hamming distance, and that will be a, net, a very cheap estimator of the real distance function. And you could do stuff like, you know, you could apply another data structure to, um, to index those, those sketches, for example. And there are many more techniques that, that have been published since then. 
Hey, thank you, Armando. Thank you.